We're ready? Okay, then we can start again. Okay, so we start talking about SMEFT again. And uh, uh, so it's nice that you have a nice parallel, I think, with the rhetoric lectures, because the stuff that we're going to do today is going to look very similar to what you have just seen about the renormalization. So there are differences because we're talking about the different um, conceptual operation that we are doing. So in general, both will be present at the same time if one wants to do a SMEF that one loop. Um, but there are some contact points. So if you look at it, uh, it, it will look similar. So already what we did yesterday, if you remember, was to um, do a partial renormalization of the theory. So we made sure that our kinetic terms are canonical, that our masses are diagonal, that the kinetic terms are diagonal, right? Um, so this is very similar to what we have just seen before. It's basically formally equivalent to the wave function renormalization of all the functions that you have in the theory. Um, it's just that instead of having infinities inside the counter terms, in this case we had three parameters, which are the Wilson coefficients. So the difference, one of the differences between uh, what we are doing here and what is normally done in the standard model is that um, in this case, we need really to keep track of where each parameters go and the dependence on these redefinitions that we have done will remain explicitly inside the wave functions and inside uh, the vertices. And it was kind of shown in the final thing that we looked at yesterday, so this is where we left it. Um, so we have explicitly that the interactions depend on a bunch of parameters that were initially uh, inside the, the two-point functions, so the propagators or, or the masses. Uh, this delta alpha here, in a way, looks like uh, the z-photon mixing uh, counter term that we, you have just used before, right? So. You can, you can find parallels, for instance, like at this point, you're basically writing the electromagnetic coupling with a SMEF correction that comes from the mixer two-point functions. So in SMEF, because the way you write down the theory is gauge invariant, you do not get any corrections, like genuine corrections to the photon-photon propagator. This will never come out. But we did get a correction to the Z photon mixing through this operator CHWB. And if you remember what you've just seen half an hour ago, this goes into the delta E, essentially. So this is really formally uh, the same. So the step that we're missing to do here is the actual renormalization scheme, which means relating this to parameters. So at this stage, um, all the quantities that appear in this Lagrangian, they are some parameters that do not bear any physical meaning yet. Okay? So the physical meaning, we have to decide it when we decide uh, what is their relation to the observables. So we're going to do that today. Um, but first, I need to take a slight detour to tell you about the flavor structure, because a part of the renormalization will depend on how we write down uh, the flavor indices. And I'll hope to be quick, so this is really not one of the main subjects of the course, but uh, you will find it around, and I think it's important to, to bear in mind because it's really used uh, as a default. Okay, so one of the things that we saw in the previous lectures was that um, most of the parameter space of this MEFT is flavorful. So we said, just because we have three fermion generations, there are some very nasty operators that give us 162 parameters just from one structure. And we did that exercise of taking one fermion current. Uh, for instance, we could take something like this. So you have, a, let's say, a, a neutral current with two, um, two fermions of the same species. So this, in particular, preserves the, the chirality in the sense that these are both uh, right-handed. Or we tried a different kind of structure where we could have, for instance, something like that. And then here in between, you could have either um, an identity in Lorentz space or a sigma mu nu tensor. In both cases, what you're doing here is that you're flipping the chirality. So you go from a right-handed to a left-handed. So these are essentially the two categories of currents that you can have in the Lagrangian. And we said, okay, if we don't have any symmetry, this guy here is gonna give me six real parts plus three imaginary ones because it's the, the coefficient in front is an Hermitian three by three matrix. Well, this is going to be a nine plus nine because it's just a generic complex three by three matrix. Uh, now, if you think about it, um, if you think of this as a matrix, the off diagonal entries are going to give you 
in general, flavor violating currents, flavor changing neutral currents there, so you could have an app that talks to a charm. So you can have all sorts of physics that you might not be interested in uh, a leading order, let's say. Um, and you might want to simplify this down by making some, some assumptions. So you, the, the obvious question is, can I just say that these are diagonal? And yes, so the appropriate way to uh, simplify this is to impose flavor symmetries, essentially. Um, so there are several options that one can impose. And when one imposes symmetries, basically the symmetry is such that only certain combination of ij, or technically really a contraction of ij, because at this point we're working in a flavor space, are allowed and the other ones are forbidden or suppressed uh, by, by something. Okay. So, one, uh, so the largest, let's say, the strongest assumption that you can make is to impose a flavor symmetry, which is U3 to the fifth. And this you find a lot because it's really the vanilla assumption. It's related to the assumption of minimal flavor violation if you have ever or heard about it. So this is something that was developed by uh, Barbieri and other people a few years ago. Uh, so the idea of this is, is very simple. So the way that you technically impose the symmetry is that, so it's to the fifth because you have uh, five fields, so you have the five gauge, five gauge uh, well-defined uh, uh, objects, and you assume that each of these transforms under its own U3. So there is a U3 of flavor, because three because you have three generations, and each of these transforms, for instance, as uh, the Q transforms with the uh, omega Q, while well, this omega in general is some element of, of U3, okay? So it's the exponential of some U3 generators and so on. And you can do the same for each of the, each of the five fields. So if you impose that this is a symmetry, um, you can check how something like this would transform and what are the conditions under which this would be invariant. So this would transform like the transformation of a U dagger, you have to pick the element I if you want to keep this notation. And then here you will have the U like that. And this is invariant, so these matrices cancel, this was a J, if in the middle here you have a delta IJ, because you're assuming a group that is, um, that is U3, sorry I didn't say it, so all of these omegas are unitary just because of the group that we are chosen. So if you want the IJs are, co are confusing, which can just write it in a, in a matrix form, you have it like this. So if you want, if you want, uh, so the gamma doesn't do anything because the, the gamma is a matrix in Lorentz space and these guys are in flavor space, so they are transparent to each other. So if you want this guy to cancel with that, you can put an identity in the middle, let's say. So this, um, with this symmetry, basically you end up having only one parameter, because at this point, the only contraction that is allowed is the one with the delta. So the way that you would write down the operator is essentially just by u bar gamma mu u with some coefficient CHU in front. And here you are assuming, so implicitly assuming without writing the indices that this flavor index is contracted with that flavor index to an identity. Because this is a mission, this is one real parameter. So you see that you have to go down from uh, 9 to 1. It's already an achievement. Uh, when you have something like this, it's a bit more problematic because if you check how this guy will transform, you have a Q bar. This will go with the U3 of the Q. Uh, but then the other one has a U3 of the down quark. So these two guys are two different groups. They don't really cancel with each other. So this object technically is forbidden by the flavor assumption. So if you want to impose that that symmetry is exact, this has to be vanishing. Now clearly you cannot have this exactly vanishing because this gives you the mass of the bottom quark, for instance, which we know that is non-zero. So what you do is that um, you insert a quantity that is called a spurion technically, which happens to be exactly uh, the Yukawa coupling of the down. And you say that this Yukawa coupling transforms in the way that cancels off what you need to cancel off. This is a trick 
that allows you, so the idea is that here you introduce a parameter that has some symmetry transformations, which are a bit awkward, but that essentially parameterizes a breaking of the symmetry. So every time you want to break a symmetry, you need to insert an object like this. And then what you do technically is that, so if you have a, so for this symmetry it's very easy, but for more complicated symmetries, you can have all sorts of spurions that transform with different combinations. But then you know that um, these have to enter the standard model Yukawa coupling. So you kind of relate the two things, and then it turns out that you can determine some of the Spurian values as a function of the Yukawas. For the, for the MFV, it is extremely easy because it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So the Spurians have to be exactly the Yukawa. So moral is that whenever you have uh, a current that flips the chirality because it has this funky group transformation, the only way that you can write down an invariant is that you write it in this way. And this is formally invariant under the group. The thing it's really doing is that this is telling you if you want to be able to write this object, you must write exactly the Yukawa in there. You cannot write something else. Um, if you want to be fancy, you could add as many powers of these objects as you want, but we are not going to do that. Okay. So if you do that, like you can put a chain of Yukawas and they will cancel against each other. And this is still invariant, but forget about it for now. Uh, a fundamental aspect that this brings up is that essentially what you are doing, you can also see it as you are introducing an extra power counting. So you are introducing another expansion parameter because this Yukawa, so except for the case of the top, which is a very peculiar case, all the Yukawas of the standard model are parameters smaller than one. So essentially, when you impose this symmetry uh, and you impose that it has to be broken exactly in this way, uh, you are providing an ordering of, of flavor effects that you, can, uh, that you can put in in the Lagrangian. So this is a leading order effect because it doesn't have any Yukawa suppression. This is already subleading because it comes with a Yukawa suppression. So you have kind of two simultaneous expansions, the one in dimensions and the one in how many Yukawas do we put in. Um, yes, the other thing is that anyways, you can decide if you, to keep it or not. So you can decide to truncate the number of Yukawas. So we're not going to pay much attention to this, but uh, this is something that people care about. Um, the important thing that we care about for today is that these goes from 9 plus 9 to 1 plus 1, okay? Because it does, so analogously to what we said here, now the only way that we can write down a current like this is that we put the Yukawa in between. We neglect terms with higher powers of the Yukawa because we have good reasons to do it. So this becomes, uh, has one coefficient in front, which however is still complex because this is still a non-hermitian current. So it needs to have a real and an imaginary part, okay? Um, there is another option that I want to mention that is used quite often, uh, which is, I'm gonna write it here because I don't wanna make a confusion, which is very used if you do top quark physics, for instance. So this is the option to use a U2 for the quarks and uh, something for the leptons, let's say U3. So for sure you want to assume that um, the, the Q and the U transform like U2, so this has to be at least a U2 cross U2. Where I mean that, uh, so let's say for the right-handed up quarks, you will have the set of the up and C uh, right-handed that transform under this uh, U2 symmetry. And this is the C. Now, I'm using the same notation, but now this is an element of U2 and not U3. While the right hand at top is split out and it's invariant. So what you do effectively here is that you take the third generation and you treat it as a singlet of flavor and you assume that you have a symmetry only among the like two. This is motivated in some BSM scenario, so it's an approximation. It's still an approximation, but if you're interested in doing top physics, it's better than the one upstairs because the one upstairs tell you that uh, all the modifications in top quark interactions are completely correlated to those in up and charm interactions, which is something that typically you don't want to assume or it might be a too strong of an assumption. 
uh, so, to do to do top query physics. Yes. The coupling of the button, you can decide. So some people, so what do you do with the D? <laughs> so you can either put a, a U2 also for the D, and at this point you play the same game, so you do the down, the strange, and, and the, but the bottom is separated. Or in some other cases, like in uh, Smith at NLO, uh, they use a U3 here for the downs. Uh, then you have the question of how to make the down talk to the left-handed part, and their answer is no, the masses of the bottom is equal to zero. <laughs> okay, so this assumption makes sense if you want to go in a five flavor scheme, essentially. So if you want to keep the bottom massless, and you just want to treat the D in neutral currents, so stuff that go like uh, D bar D, you can treat this as a, as a U3. And, and so the bottom goes together with the other quarks and it simplifies a bunch of things. If you care about keeping the, the bottom mass, then you don't really want to do this because then you have the complication of making a U2 talking with a U3. Um, so that's, that's not ideal. Like you might want to separate the third generation also for the bottoms. Uh, another thing that you can ask here is what about the CKM mixing? So like if I want to have a mixing between the top and the light two generations, and the answer is, don't. <laughs> no, you can. So there are papers that do it. Uh, but the way this is done is that you need to introduce spurions even there. So you need to break this symmetry in order to have CKM mixing because uh, this is really separating the two objects. So it, the, the, these are two fields that don't talk to each other. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Yes. Um, and you need to introduce, so these purions that make, make the two things connect, and then you have to impose that they're equal to the CKM angles, and the thing becomes a bit sophisticated. And most of the time, it's not really relevant, because anyways, the mixing of the third generation with the first two is not that large. Uh, so it can be neglected for phenomenology most of the time. This is actually one of the aspects. So there are different ways of interpreting what one is actually doing when assuming these symmetries. Um, if you look at LHC physics, symmetries are typically used to eat up some ignorance uh, in the sense that, for instance, um, when you measure, so you never really distinguish the flavors of the light quarks. So at the LHC, the only way that you see, jet, that you see quarks are in jets or in the PDFs. Uh, and in both cases, you cannot really isolate a charm or a strange from an up or a down. So you can never, it doesn't make much sense to have separate parameters for each because it's difficult to distinguish them. It's hard to break them down, one second. <laughs> so in a way, it is convenient to just group them together. It is an assumption, but at least you have one compact object that, that, treats, uh, that treats both. Um, another thing is that, so you are also making the statement of, I don't care about flavor change in neutral currents. This is not the kind of physics that I'm looking for. But if you happen to be interested in that, like you want to do a flavor violating top decay, then you might not want to assume any symmetry at all and just go for the free, uh, for the free indices. So it's a simplification that is done most of the time, especially when people do like uh, Higgs uh, physics or anything that is not flavor sensitive. If you want to introduce low energy observables or flavor observables, then you also need to think about how to make the, the various things uh, match, let's say. So it, it's mostly an approximation. Yes. Yes, but then, yes, yes. No, sure, yes. No, in, that, in that case, you, you need to keep into account. Uh, I mean, so, I mean, this doesn't tell you, um, this doesn't tell you that they don't mix. You can still make them mix. It just makes the parameterization uselessly complicated. So at that point, you might as well just put the indices. It really, so it's kind of process dependent what is convenient and then there is a question how to combine everything. Um, but it's also a matter of, like in some analysis, it's really useless that you have 20 parameters that you cannot distinguish, right? So just put a symmetry and, and then you hope that you can map to another case if you can. Okay. Uh, yes, so I have a table there just to close this quickly. So these are the same operators that we looked at yesterday. Uh, this is the number of parameters that they had in the flavor general. So uh, this, is, this is always CP even plus CP odd, so real plus imaginary parts. 
And this is the numbers that you see after you introduce a symmetry. So if you put the strongest one, which is U3 to the fifth, all these numbers go down dramatically. Uh, the Ys in bracket tell you how many U covers you have to put in. So in the one upstairs is exactly the one that we did there, and it tells you that you have to put in a U cover of the, of the down. So there is one plus one parameter, but really suppressed. So in some cases, this really tells you that you can really forget about the operator. Uh, in this ugly beast, because it has two uh, chirality flipping currents, one with the leptons and one with the quarks, you need to put one Yukawa of each. So this is really Yukawa squared suppressed, and this is so if you choose to have some sort of flavor power counting and decide that this is really a small number, you can kill it off from your basis directly. It's just some higher order in the flavor suppression. Um, and so for if you have uh, U2, in the quark sector, so here I'm putting U2 also in the bottom. Uh, and U3 for the leptons, this is how the numbers change. Uh, so there are, only, uh, there are only minor differences. Okay, so uh, maybe it's good to say, so this guy here in particular, if you have U2, it becomes two parameters trivially because uh, now you go, so from having this operator structure in general to having the version, with the light two generations, so this little u now it's only the up and the charm, and then you have the version with the top. Okay, so what, when you have u2, what you need to do is that you really need to double up all the fields. You have the light fields and the heavy fields, and so you have two versions of everything, and when you have four fermion operators, you have to be careful with the combinations, but okay, it's not rocket science. Okay, so this is about the flavor, so for most of what comes next, I'm just gonna write down things with this U3 to the fifth. So I'm gonna now write down flavor indices. I'm gonna assume that this is uh, symmetric. Okay, so I'm gonna erase a bit the, the blackboards and we can look at the, at the renormalization, which is really a discussion of the input uh, parameters. So I'm gonna use a language that, I mean, conceptually this is the same as you have seen in the previous lecture, um, but when you do SMEFT, you have sometimes a little bit of different, con so it's a different focus, let's say. Um, so I will tell you, let's say, how this is done operatively in SMEF, but then if you look at it closely, uh, you will definitely see that this is conceptually the same thing that you have done before. Okay, so the point of uh, the input quantities, and we were here, is that the parameters that we have in the Lagrangian, they are not uh, physically meaningful. We have to decide how to relate them to, um, to observables. So we can start of thinking how we did in, in the standard model. So this is a repetition of what you have just seen an hour ago. In the standard model, you have 19 independent quantities. Okay, so you take the Lagrangian of the standard model, you count how many letters appear. And there are 19, so there is basically alpha S. Technically, there is also theta QCD. Uh, then you have the four parameters for the electric sector that you can write like this. You have the Yukawas, and you have the CKM angle, so theta, one, two, three, and the CP phase. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is for QCD people again. <laughs> uh, this, okay, this is kind of peculiar and we'll talk about it in a second. Uh, this is the electroweak sector and it is very similar. So I'm including in the electroweak sector W, Z, and Higgs. Um, so these are, so you have always two parameters for uh, the scalar potential, I'm talking about standard models, you know? And then you have two more parameters for the gauge part than you can think of in different ways. Uh, I like to think of them in terms of the coupling constants that you had at the very beginning. So with G and G prime, you can make theta, you can make E, you can make the masses, you can make everything that you want. So for concreteness, let's say that you have these four. Uh, these Yukawas, there's uh, nine of them, if I'm not wrong. And then you have the, the CKM angles. So what you do is that you need to essentially, so what we do in practice normally is that we assign 
numerical values to these objects by relating them to observables. So no one tells you that G has to be 0 0.6. We have to relate it to something that we can measure. So you do the thing that you have just seen, you decide that a certain combination of this G and G prime, for instance, is the electromagnetic coupling that you measure in the Thomson limit, and then you will be able to give it a value. Or you can decide that V is uh, the Fermi constant, and then you measure the muon decay, and you give it a value, and so on and so forth. So you do this operation in which you define what you mean by these parameters, and once you have numbers, then you can plug them in your Monte Carlo or in your numerical calculation and get predictions. And conceptually, I think this is very important. What you always do when you calculate some prediction for physics is that you are relating observable to observable. So this is kind of an intermediate uh, step that we need for the math to interpolate things. But what you do eventually is that you calculate, for instance, the W mass given a certain alpha or vice versa. So the final statement that you always make is a statement of uh, consistency between a group of measurements that you take in and a group of measurements that you spit out. You can even change the ordering, um, but what the theory gives, so the theory consistency is really the, the statement that, so if you take one in and you produce one out, then, then you get the correct results, so the relation between them is, is correct. So to fix uh, these 19 quantities, typically you need at least 19 measurements, okay? Some of them are a bit funky because uh, so they belong to non-perturbative physics and are hard to extract. So for instance, for the Yukawa, you would like to have the fermion masses, and you just heard that for the quarks, this is a bit of a lousy definition. I'm going to ignore that detail for now because, uh, yeah, for, for SMEFT purposes, this is a separate discussion. For the leptons, you can definitely measure this, okay? So the Yukawas come from uh, from the quark masses. Uh, the CKM is also, um, so the case, the case of the CKM, I'm gonna put it together, curiously, with the case of alpha S, uh, because both of them, really normally, in the standard model, they are not extracted from one measurement. They are extracted from a fit to different measurements. So alpha S typically is extracted together with the PDFs. So you have a set of, uh, scattering processes like the one that we mentioned yesterday. And, and in the fit, you have many parameters that define the, the PDF structure, and you have also alpha S as one of those. So you do a global fit with many parameters and many observables at the same time, and you extract this quantity. So this is not really defining one specific process. CKM is the same. You have many flavor physics processes, semi-leptonic decays, or other processes in, uh, in meson physics, for instance. Um, and then you do these fits, if you have ever seen them, where you check the unitarity and you kind of extract the parameters such that everything, uh, everything matches. Uh, the electric sector is a bit special and is the one that is better behaved uh, in a sense because, as you have just seen, this is always done because we need precision. This is usually done with a specific choice of observables. So typically we have a few measurements. So it can be alpha, okay, alpha you can have it as zero or at mz, okay? You can have the mass of the z in the sense of the pole mass. You can have uh, the pole mass of the w. You can have this pseudo-observable or sine squared theta f uh, leptonic that is something measured um, originally at lep in leptonic currents. Um, and you have, of course, uh, the mass of the Higgs, the pole mass. You can have G Fermi in the mu decay, so mu that goes to E nu nu. Typically, this is the range of options that one has. Um, and you can make a choice. So we have four parameters. So typically, we choose four among these quantities. And we decide, we decide that these four definitions, so these four quantities are those that define the parameters, and the other ones are actually predicted quantities that we can use to test, okay? Um, so some choices are forced, for instance. The mass of the Higgs you cannot do without because otherwise you cannot break down the lambda from the V. So the mass of the Higgs is definitely required because you need to have information about um, 
the scalar potential. Uh, sine theta, I don't like theta in general. <laughs> so you could do it. Um, it, it, it introduces uh, complications, so this is not a very popular choice for SMEF. It is sometimes for the two-week corrections in standard model, but for, for SMEF, this is not uh, this, this is not the most convenient, so I'm going to put it in bracket. And then we are left with four things, so alpha, mz, mw, and g Fermi, with which we need to fix the other three. And here there is a bit more discussion. So you heard before that for electric calculations in the standard model, uh, the typical options that are chosen is mw, mz, and one of the two alphas, so you have to be careful which alpha to specify. Um, sometimes you also have this G mu scheme, which is uh, basically taking G as, a, as an input, and his math is more or less the same. So people are producing results with different input schemes. Uh, they have pros and cons, like, um, like everywhere. And I'm going to tell you in a, in a nutshell how this is done. So for this, I'm going to focus to this set of parameters because I'm assuming that the other ones are, are defined uh, one way or, or another. So I will also comment briefly on the Yukawas because the Yukawas ignoring all the issues due to how exactly we measure this, they are also in one-to-one -one relation with something that is observable. So one Yukawa, one mass. Um, theta QCD, fine, it is measured. We don't really care about theta QCD for now because it's a different realm. This is measured in the, well, there's an upper limit on the, uh, electric dipole of the neutron. These guys are extracted from fits, um, so they cannot really be put in one-to-one -one relation, so I will ignore it, and then I will comment briefly at the end on how this is done. So what you want to do in the SMEF for the electric sector is essentially um, you want to take, so you want to choose the observables, calculate the observable with the Lagrangian that you have at this stage, so with those parameters in, and then sort of invert the system such that you extract the parameters as a function of the measurement. Okay, so, uh, do I have the right piece of paper? I don't know where I left it. Oh, okay. um, so I'm gonna write down, so the electromagnetic alpha, if you calculate it uh, with the Lagrangian, will be this. You have a g squared, you have a g prime squared, and the, sim the sum of the two. Notice that I'm using the four parameters that I want, okay? So I could have sine thetas, but no, don't put thetas ever. Uh, so this is much uh, safer because it's exactly what enters through the covariant derivative. And then this receives the corrections of one plus delta alpha. So this thing I'm essentially reading off from here. So alpha is this guy squared. Okay, because it is squared, this factor of two goes away in the expansion, so this becomes a one plus delta alpha. The W mass, I can also read off from there. Uh, and this is simply G squared, there is a VT, so yeah, sorry, so the V I forgot, but it's, it's the true vacuum, of course, uh, four, divided by four. This doesn't get any corrections, and this you see up there. This is just what I have in the Lagrangian. There's nothing else, no SMEFT operator coming in. For the Z boson, instead, I do have some corrections. So that's the VT squared, uh, G squared plus G prime squared divided by four. And then you will have a one plus delta MZ squared. Yes. And finally, for G Fermi, I'm assuming that this is extracted from the mu and decay. So this is an assumption specifically that G Fermi and not another one. Um, this will be one over square root of two of the, the true vacuum and one plus this delta GF. Okay. So this is a three level, of course. If you want to do math at one loop, you need to repeat this operation at one loop. We are not going to do that. Um, this big delta, so I'm going to distinguish the big delta from the small delta. So this big delta is uh, the stuff that you see here. So this is a function of the Wilson coefficients, and it's um, essentially math corrections that come in at the, bare, at the Lagrangian level inside these objects. 
the small delta will be used for uh, induced corrections in the predictions. Okay, so this expression does not mean that I will observe a, a deviation from the standard model when I go and measure alpha. It means that in the Lagrangian I have this formula and if I choose alpha as an input, I decide that this is whatever I measure. Okay. So you have these four expressions and if you want to determine, uh, well, I forgot the mass of the Higgs, sorry, but okay. The mass of the Higgs is always there and you can read it off also from there. So this is lambda vt squared and one plus delta mh squared. Okay. So the delta mh squared contains the piece of the kinetic term, so the two point function and the piece directly from the h to the six operator. Um, the delta mz contains the piece, the piece that comes from uh, the z photon mixing and the piece of this CHD that is kind of the raw parameter, but I don't want to over confuse you. So it is another operator that enters only this, and this is something that directly comes from the operator. You open it and you have a term that corrects the Z mass. And the one from alpha comes from the two point function. Okay, so those are all there. All there. Uh, the parameters that are relevant here are CH box, D and W, and the CHD for the mass. So there's like four operators in total that are relevant for this game. Delta GF, I haven't written it, so I should, I'm gonna put it here. So Delta GF is the one that depends on the flavor. And I'm gonna write it like this. So this is CL3 uh, minus CLL prime. And I have to tell you who this guy is. So Delta GF is like that because uh, I'm saying that I take it from the muon decay. So in the muon decay is the two diagrams that you saw before. There's a muon, there's a neutrino, and then here we'll have uh, another neutrino and an electron. I have a W here. So here or here, so I'm, I'm putting two squares, but really I mean the diagram with one plus the diagram with the other. Uh, this operator is CHL3 that enters there with some prefactor. And this is also CHL3. Because I'm assuming a flavor symmetry that I have a muon or that I have an electron doesn't make any difference, it's exactly the same parameter. But then I also have another diagram which is the contact point. No, no, and E. And this is an operator that is CLL. It is CLL because um, we want all left-handed currents. I mean, there are neutrinos, so we don't really have other options. So the only thing that really contributes there is an operator that looks like L bar L and L bar L, like this. And what we want to do is that um, basically, because this is only neutral current, so in the way that the Warsaw basis is defined, there is no Pauli matrix in between. So these are all two neutral currents. So we really want to take um, an electron bar and the muon, and then a muon neutrino bar and an electron neutrino. So from this, we want to extract this particular flavor component. This is the one that goes in that um, in the interaction. So it means that at the level of flavor contractions, this flavor index needs to be contracted with this guy and this needs to be contracted with this guy. This is completely allowed by the U3 symmetry. So this is a U3 vector. So it's a three bar in the three, so you contract and then make a singlet. So from the point of view of the symmetry, this is completely allowed. Um, but clearly this is not the obvious uh, flavor contraction that would have been this guy with this guy and this with that, right? So for this particular operator, when you have the flavor symmetry, the U3, you can have two structures. You can have CLL and CLL prime, where CLL is the one that is straight and CLL prime is the one that is crossed. And because we are interested in a flavor changing process because it's immune decay, the only one that enters is the one that is crossed and the other one doesn't because it does only um, neutral currents essentially. Does that make sense?
Okay, so this is the formula for the delta GF, the other one's on there, so I'm gonna leave this up. And now we can look at options. Uh, so we said that the Higgs mass we have to keep, so the Higgs mass is always in, and then we need to choose three among the others. Um, so the choices that are more popular for some uh, historical reasons are the following. So in one case, you take the mass of the Higgs, then you take the mass of the Z, G Fermi, and alpha at some scale that we'll comment on in a second. In another case, you take the mass of the Z, G Fermi, and the mass of the W. And then there is one that for some reason is less popular, although it makes perfect sense, which is the MZ. MW and alpha at some scale. These are typically the three things that are discussed uh, when people think about input schemes in, in SMEFT. Um, so what this means is that if you take, for instance, the first, no, let's take the second because it's much simpler. <laughs> if you take, for instance, the second scheme, um, you are deciding that uh, all the masses are inputs and G Fermi is an input, which means that, for instance, your electromagnetic alpha will be an output. Okay, so your electromagnetic alpha is something that is calculated and then you have to check if the measurement fits. Well, if you take the first one, then MW is something that is calculated and so then you have to check if the measurement fit in there. Um, the physics doesn't depend on this because it's always a relation between observables, right? So in one case, you're fixing an W and checking an alpha, and in the other case, you're doing the opposite. But what matters is relation between the two. So if, they, if the standard model is good, you should find agreement in both cases. If you have new physics, you should find disagreement in both cases, just written in a different form. So say that we take the second guy here. So it means that out of uh, those four equations that you have up there, we take the last three. And what we do is that we solve uh, for the variables. So we solve for the G, G prime, VT, and lambda. And you can imagine that, so this system is non-linear, no, in these parameters, there's V squared and G squared everywhere. Um, and they depend on this delta. So what you do is that you solve and then obviously you expand again in the SMEFT uh, correction, so you linearize out again. Uh, so the G is better if I write G squared. This comes out to be four square root of two, G Fermi times MW squared, times one minus delta GF over two, the G prime squared is the same thing uh, whew, with MZ squared times one minus MW squared over MZ squared. This is essentially the sine theta, but I'm never gonna write theta. And this is one minus delta GF over two and minus delta MZ squared over one sorry, over two, and then there is again, and then W squared over MZ squared. Okay, the bracket went a bit to hell, but you understand it. Uh, VT is simpler, so VT squared is one over square root of two G Fermi, uh, times one plus delta G Fermi over two. And lambda has to be the mass of the Higgs square times G Fermi square root of two, one minus delta G Fermi and minus delta MH squared. Okay, so this is stuff that you take solving those three equations uh, plus the one for MH squared and then we're expanding out um, if you look at them, you should notice that they also make sense in terms of 
this guy depends on GFermi and ends up having a correction in GFermi, so it looks like I'm expanding the dependence on this parameter, including its correction. This guy depends on uh, GFermi and MZ, and it receives a correction for the delta GF and delta MZ. So it's like, it, it looks like I have expanded, so this is also uh, the same. Uh, if you think in terms of expansions, the signs are flipped in the sense of, so if you wanted to say I have a structure that is MH squared times GF and I want to do MH plus corrections and expanding that corrections, you will get pluses here, but instead you get minuses. Here you would get a minus, but it's a plus because it's a denominator. So the signs are flipped because what you, we have, H, so because these are not the corrections to the, to the quantities in a sense. So the signs are flipped because we have inverted the place where the corrections are in. So we have said, uh, that the object plus correction is GFermi, and so the naive calculation of GFermi um, is the same minus the correction. Sorry, I'm, 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 I'm overcomplicating the, the story, but I, I think you can get it, but looking at the math. Uh, if we chose another input scheme, we would get completely different expressions for these parameters. So the expressions in front, uh, would change because they would be in terms of alpha, for instance. You would not see GF, you would see complicated expressions of alpha, which at three level in the standard model are identical to the other, but at the level of the measurement, they don't they necessarily. And the expressions for the corrections would change. So like, um, here you have that the correction to G prime has this particular set of parameters, and if you change the input scheme, the correction to G prime will have a different uh, set of parameters that enter in there. What you do in the end is that you take these guys, uh, so you literally treat them like you have wrote something like your G now is your measured G in the sense that this quantity now can become a number because you take the measurement of GF, you can take the measurement of GW, and you write it as G1 plus some relative correction that has this particular form here. You take this object and you put it in the Lagrangian and so this guy will now start entering into all the expressions of the predictions. In the end of the day, the net result is that you want to relate input to output. You had some parameters that entered into the input and you have redefined your parameters such that those corrections are now shifted to the output, but the relative difference between the two is remain unchanged. So now you can calculate using all the numbers and all the places where those math parameters enter is in the prediction. Um, so what happens in this particular case, for instance, is that alpha is an output, so you can calculate that uh, you will have a correction if I don't get lost with all the pieces of paper. I don't know where I have it anymore. No, okay, let's do the opposite. Uh, no, yes, okay, sorry. So in this particular scheme, we said alpha is an output. So alpha now is a prediction of, of your theory, which means really you take uh, the expressions that you have up there for your parameters, you put them in the Lagrangian, so you take that expression that we have for the coupling to photons in the, uh, in the covariant derivative, you express it in terms of G and G prime like they are up there, you expand out all the deltas that you get, and you see already that you will have delta GF and delta MZ that enter into the coupling to the photon, right? So in the end, when you get the photon coupling, it will have uh, some constant E, well, okay, really, this is uh, G times G prime, so the, the, the hat quantities in the sense that these are uh, the numerical values that come from the measurement. And then it will have a one minus delta GF over two, uh, a minus delta MZ squared, and now I have to, to write tan theta, but I'll tell you what this is and plus a delta alpha. So 
This is something that can be written like a one plus the predicted correction to the electromagnetic interaction. This uh, tan theta really means uh, the sine theta squared, well, yes, so it's, it's the sine theta squared divided by cosine theta squared with the, so, okay, with a one minus s theta squared, where the s theta squared is calculated as one minus mw over mz. Okay, so whenever I write theta as above, it's a shortcut to really mean uh, something that is extracted from the measurement of W and Z because those are my inputs. Um, so now this is a small delta. So what I'm really saying here is that if I measure the pole mass of the Z, I measure the pole mass of the W, I measure the Fermi, I do all my calculation, then I can go and take uh, the measurement of anything that has electromagnetic couplings in it and treat it as a test. So this is a prediction that if I am in SMEFT, my electromagnetic coupling will deviate compared to the prediction that is based on the other input by this quantity that contains all the operators there. So there will be some CHWB, some, some CHD, uh, and some CH, uh, no, only those. And sorry, and the, the, the fermionic ones of the delta G Fermi. So these guys will also end up correctly correcting alpha. This starts to be super counterintuitive, okay? So you can write down a four fermion operator with four leptons and it ends up correcting the electromagnetic coupling, okay? So this is the reason why this needs to be done uh, slowly step by step and kind of revising what we are really doing. Um, if we took two of the other inputs, the expressions are different. I'm not gonna have uh, time to go over them. Uh, but for instance, so I'm just gonna write this one here. So in this scheme here, MW is an output. So if you want to say, uh, I want to do a fit of MW in SMEFT, I want to confront this measurement uh, because there are some deviations and see if I could have a SMEFT interpretation of the CDF measurement that you cannot use MW as an input because otherwise you are defining that to be non-deviating. So you need to take some other reference point and you can decide to take alpha. And then at this point, um, you will solve the system, you will find different expressions and you will get at the end with an expression of uh, MW squared that has, so this will turn out to be MZ squared and cos theta squared um, times whatever you have in the deviation of the G coupling that comes out from the solution plus twice the deviation of the true vacuum. And this will come out to be a not so beautiful expression, which has cos theta squared, cosine of two theta delta mz squared, plus sine theta squared divided two, the cosine of two theta delta alpha minus delta gf. Okay. Where, now, this, this theta is something completely different, okay? So this theta here is such that sine theta squared is the super horrible um, expression that is one half, one minus, one minus two square root of two pi alpha. You have the mass of this square, you have G Fermi, you have a fantastic square root here, and this is your <laughs> sine squared theta, okay? So if you have, um, if you have MZ, G Fermi, and alpha as inputs, the way that you extract the mixing angle is really this one. So your definition, numerical definition of mixing angle is, is different. It comes from alpha, and it doesn't come from MW. MW is your prediction, and it's gonna have this horrible calculation. So you have the, all the uh, suspicious parameters, all the four parameters of the inputs enter there, and then you can see which one fits best. Uh, your prediction. So you can check that, um, I mean, if you think about it, this is trivial, but what happens is that if you take, for instance, this kind of uh, input scheme, you do the thing of solving the equations, and then you plug your solution back into the Lagrangian. If you have alpha as an input, uh, this correction here cancels out exactly. 
by definition, I mean, that's what you're imposing essentially, right? So it's kind of tautological, but if you do it, it's, it's a nice check. Um, and so on. Okay, so a couple of comments. Uh, I wasn't very specific about the scale at which alpha is evaluated, and it's something that uh, comes up periodically and needs to be discussed. Um, so because here we're mostly concerned with, with SMEFT issues, then okay, all director week and LO issues remain there, so those pull in a certain direction. Uh, but for the side of, of the SMEFT, what happens is that if you are interested, for instance, in measurements at the LHC, so where you are at energies that are at the Z mass and above, so you're definitely, when you're at the LHC, you're definitely above all that tower of QCD resonances that we just heard about before. So uh, the relation between alpha evaluated at zero and alpha evaluated M MS, sorry, MZ squared, there is some delta alpha in between, no? That you just heard about. That delta alpha is some non-perturbative thing that is measurable, but it basically contains non-perturbative elements that are due to the infinite tower of resonances that you have there from QCD. If you are in SMEFT uh, and you want to use alpha measured at zero to do physics above uh, the tower of resonances, technically, you should take your alpha and run it through. In the resonances, you will have a gazillion four fermion operators with quarks that can modify the resonance structures. So you have the operators that modify the QCD part. And technically, if you want to be careful with this thing, those will become part of your prediction. So if you, if you are at alpha at zero and you want to cross that, technically you should really pick them up. Uh, no one knows how to do that, okay? So it is more convenient sometimes to just say, okay, I just take alpha at MZ. So I go to the Z pole, I measure it, this gives me a number. It is independent of everything. I just define it in this way as an observable. I ignore <laughs> new physics that could have contributed to the, to the previous part. And then I do my physics at higher energy starting from, uh, from there. Uh, there are some other considerations about MW, for instance. So MW is a bit of a controversial observable because now, uh, so the idea is that your inputs should be something that is very precisely measured. No? So you're always making a statement of uh, predicted versus, versus input. Um, in order to reduce the theoretical uncertainties on your predictions, essentially, you want to keep as stable as a starting point as you can. Okay, so you want to say alpha is measured to the precision of, I don't know, seven digits. So basically, I can, I can even forget the fact that I use it as an input. So this is my God-given exact value, and then I do predictions uh, with that that are very precise. If I have an input parameter that moves around, that is a bit shaky, has a large theory uncertainty, then this should propagate into my prediction, and then I'm not sure how I'm comparing exactly. So MW doesn't exactly satisfy the super high precision prediction. It did before CDF. I mean, it was enough for, to, do, um, to do LSC measurements. Now it's a bit under debate. Um, but still, sometimes people like it uh, to keep as an input uh, because of something that we're going to see next. Uh, so the fact that if you are in SMEFT and your MW is a prediction, then the expression for MW that you're supposed to use is this. Okay, and where does MW enter? It enters in propagators. It enters in denominators. And we don't like to have SMEF at the denominator. Um, the idea is that, so the expansion should work uh, no matter what. So you should be able to expand linearly in your EFT correction. And also having this object that moves the pole around compared to the standard prediction is not really nice when, when you want to calculate. So the very last thing that we need to see in order to complete the story of EFT predictions are corrections to the propagators. Now this is done in a very uh, naive way. But the important point is to remember that they exist. Uh, and I will give you at least one example of a case where they are obviously relevant. If I just find the place where I took my notes. Okay. Uh, I have mixed notes. Amazing. 
So the idea is that in the propagator you always have, so I'm gonna use some uh, approximation again. Uh, say that you have a scalar propagator, which is the simpler, then we can also do the vector or the Fermi one, but that, that's okay. Um, your scalar propagator is always something that has an i, and then you're gonna have a q squared, the mass of the scalar, and then in general, you're gonna have something here that I'm gonna write in this way. This is the guy that gives you a bright Wigner distribution when you square it, so, okay. So if you are at higher orders, this is the, uh, there is some propagator that you have to include. In this case, I'm just gonna keep it as the mass times the width. Uh, and what happens in, in SMEFT is that in general, uh, your mass will keep its standard model expression, plus it will receive small delta correction, so an actual correction that is a prediction. And the same thing will happen to the decay width. Uh, this is an S. Okay, so you have a guy that decays, I don't know, like you have a Higgs that goes to BB bar. Clearly, there is some operator there that can modify that interaction. So this will modify the decay width of the, of the scalar. And the same thing in principle um, for the mass happens. Now for, uh, specifically for scalars, we don't have to worry because one scalar in SMEFT, it's the Higgs and its mass has to be taken as an input. Uh, but I still do the calculation for the scalars because it's simpler in terms of notation. But the one, so there is a one for vectors and a one for fermion that are essentially equivalent because the only thing that matters is the denominator, okay? Um, so it is gonna become relevant for W in most cases. That's the only one that is really under debate. Um, so because you have these two corrections, what you kind of would like to do when you do SMEFT is that you want to end up with an amplitude that has some, let's say, linear dependence on the Wilson coefficients. Uh, this is linear, but when it goes there, it goes to the denominator. Uh, so you would like to expand it out. So to expand it out, if you do the calculation, you get something like this. So you have uh, the, the propagator, let's say, in SMEFT, which is, uh, that propagator up there, so with that, that structure where everything is standard model. I'm gonna write standard model, but it's just the same. Uh, times one minus some expression. Uh, so this is again the Q squared minus MS squared plus I MS gamma S yet again. And here you will have some delta gamma and a plus two I one minus I gamma twice the mass and the correction to the mass. Plus uh, higher orders essentially. So this is all for the scalars clearly. Tuck, 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 tuck. Okay. Okay. You take this, you plug them there, you expand linearly, Taylor series. Uh, this is what you obtain. I am missing a bracket. So you get that basically you have linearized out the corrections to the width and the corrections to the mass. Now, if your mass is an input, this is automatically zero because this is the predicted correction, but the correction to the width, there's no way you escape it. All the widths are corrected, right? So all the vertices have some SMAFT operator inside. Um, so you always have at least the, the delta width. Um, so this is simply something that, that needs to be taken into account. Uh, so the linearization is not always uh, well behaved. This really assumes that these deltas are small numerically. Um, I can show you a plot just to visualize how this goes. Uh, this is done for the W, but okay, so the only difference between the vector is that you have the transverse structure above. Um, so the plot here is really just showing the, uh, the absolute value of the propagator. So at this point, this is still a complex uh, quantity, right? So I'm just taking the absolute uh, value. So this guy has the pole, okay? I'm doing it for the W, so it has the pole at 80 point something. 
Um, the propagator in the standard model is drawn as uh, a blue line that you don't particularly see well, but there's one in, in both cases. And so the plot to the left is essentially the piece. Um, it's, so it's essentially not the piece, but like it's the, the propagator obtained setting this guy to zero and just changing the deviation, so the correction to the width to be, uh, for instance, 1%, 10%, or 50% of the standard model value. This is calculated on, on the W, so it is normalized to the decay width of the W. Okay. So if you have something that starts off with a larger width, then this, this could be a different effect. Uh, but you see that, so here the linearization works quite decently. Uh, it fails, so it gives you something that really doesn't look like a nice propagator if you have a large correction of 50%. So I imagine that you really go and you calculate an amplitude with a propagator that looks like this. So it's a user propagator times an access structure. Uh, this is not super duper kosher, but it is a small effect that kind of mimics what would happen uh, by changing the width if you are in the, in the small limit. If the width starts becoming large, this shape start having, starts having a dip, so it starts looking ugly. For the case of the mass, so now you forget about the width correction and you just put the mass uh, deviation. Here the numbers are much smaller. And because you're moving the pole, this is much more sensitive to what, what uh, you are doing. Um, and you see that, so if you have a 1% correction, this is still okay. So the deviation is the, is the solid one. So what it does is that it moves a little bit um, the pole. So it deforms a bit the shape of the propagator moving the pole a bit to the left. But the moment it starts to be already like 5%, it starts having a funky kink, uh, which kind of mimics the moving of, of the pole to some extent, but then it has to compensate, like the shape has to compensate somewhere else. So it creates a dip that is quite unnatural compared to what it should have. And when it's 10%, this is already off. So this is something that if you have in, uh, so the, the conclusion of, of this story is you're working with MEFT, so you, you, you like to linearize out uh, new physics corrections. But the moment um, these new physics corrections are formally large in the calculation that you're doing, this linearizing out starts not making any sense immediately. So you have to choose, so either you work with something that is linearized out, but then you have to expect really tiny effects, otherwise this calculation is unphysical, or uh, essentially you keep effective operators at the denominator. That's the alternative. So you can always decide to keep effective operators at the denominator. Then your calculation will be formally a bit ambiguous from the EFT point of view because it's not defined at which order you are calculating. You're not saying this is order delta or delta squared or this contains the infinite series, right? Uh, but if that delta is relatively large, this is kind of better behaved. So there's a bit of both. In the end of the day, this is one of the reasons, uh, this confusion here, uh, why Sometimes, very often actually, it is preferred to keep the W mass as an input because if the W mass is an input, all the masses are inputs and we get completely rid <laughs> of any issues related to this. The only thing that we will have to worry about is corrections to the width, but this is fine. This we can treat. Those are better behaved. Uh, we can linearize them out. It's a decent compromise and, and they don't cause as many as many issues, okay? So moving the pole is a bit tricky. So moving the pole is not really something that can be expressed easily in terms of mass expansion, let's say. So you start having contradictions uh, between, between the things. Um, so to make a bit more contact with something that you might be more familiar with about this weird uh, propagator correction, now we are gonna forget about a correction to the mass uh, for the rest of, uh, the lectures. Uh, I just want to make you look at the correction to the decay with, to make you notice something that should make you understand why these corrections are, are needed. Um, so this correction to the width uh, becomes uh, clearly important if you go somewhere close to the narrow width approximation. So if you look at this propagator structure here, it becomes large and over the one, let's say, it becomes, becomes relevant. So the case when the particle is on shell is essentially the case 
where you are producing it physically and then decaying it, which is the case where typically you use the narrow width approximation. So typically if you have, uh, wait, how can I do it? Ah, maybe I don't have the full, okay, interesting. Uh, so typically you have, let's say that you have, uh, yes, something like that. You can have Z boson, for instance, right? So you are at the LHC or you are uh, at lab, so you have some two fermions initial state and then this guy decays. Uh, the typical thing is that if you want to have it on shell, you can calculate this process as the cross section of your, I don't know, QQ that goes to Z. And then you can multiply by the branch ratio of the Z going to whatever final state you're looking at. Okay. You do this splitting of first I produce it and then I decay it. And this is a very good approximation to the cross section of the whole process when uh, the Z is on shell. Um, so the way that you get to this result is that you take uh, the narrow width approximation, which what it does technically is that whenever you have a propagator structure that looks like this, so in your amplitude, you're gonna have this thing at the denominator. This is the propagator. It is the absolute value squared because I'm squaring the amplitude. So this enters into the amplitude squared of whatever I'm calculating. Uh, if you open it up, you can see that this is Q squared minus M squared, everything squared, and then there's plus M squared gamma squared. And if you take uh, the limit of this thing where gamma over M goes to zero in the distribution sense, so this is a distribution in Q squared, um, then you will find that this is the same as doing pi m over gamma and the delta function of q squared minus m squared. This is something that in uh, distribution uh, mathematics this is known. Uh, and this is something that has been used forever, okay? So the technical step that you do to go from this to the situation where you first produce and then decay is that you are really forcing the guy to be exactly where the q squared is on the mass shell. And then you will have these numerical factors that I don't have a lot of time to cover what they do in the calculation in detail, but believe me that once you, uh, so to calculate the cross section, you need to add up all the um, phase space integration and the phase space normalization factors in front, right? For the production and for the decay. So the numerical factor that comes out here is exactly what you need in order to separate the cross section of something um, that goes through the intermediate particle to the separation into production cross-section times range ratio. okay? So this is something that is quite standard in resonance physics. And the point that I want to make is that if you think of that in SMEFT, so if you now start off, uh, from, from the process already factorized, so you have sigma cross branch ratio. This is really a production cross section times a partial decay width divided by a total decay width of whatever particle you are producing, right? So if you want to do this uh, in SMEFT, always at dimension six, linear and so on and so forth, you would write this as, this is the standard model piece. So the same thing evaluated in the standard model. And then this must receive the relative correction of the production. It has to receive the relative correction to the partial decay width. And then you have to subtract off the relative correction to the total decay width. Right, so this is just Taylor expanding the expression that you have. So if you think that you're producing something in narrow width, you will need to put together all the corrections to all the pieces. And the point is this guy 
If instead you calculate with the full process, so QQ to Z to EE, you will, so you will, in this case, you will get, so this is a total branch ratio, right? And you will have uh, one plus uh, this correction to the total branch ratio. Okay, so if you do it in error width, you produce something on shell, you decay it. So the way that you expect this to go is that you have pieces of corrections that come from production, from partial width, from total width. If you think of this as one process that goes through an intermediate propagator, you expect this to be a total cross section that has some sort of corrections from SMEF, okay? Now, this piece that appears in an error width that is the total correction, the only way that you can find it, so these two have to be the same in the limit that, that the narrow-width approximation is valid, right? This piece, the only way that can appear here is that you are remembering to include the propagator correction inside your diagram. If you forget to have the propagator correction inside your diagram, you will never have this piece here. There is nothing in, like, if you calculate SMEF corrections like this, Right? You have your vertex, you have another vertex, you think of all the vertices that you can have. Uh, you will get very nicely the correction to the prediction, you will get the correction to the decay, but you will never get out this. So this is the piece that comes really from correcting the, the propagator. And if you look at the math, uh, this is a minus in front, okay? So this is the correct sign as the minus that is there. Uh, it is relevant only when the guy is on shell, and if you take the on shell limit, of this expression, maybe I even have it, yes. So if you take the limit of Q squared that is very close to M squared there, um, I need the other piece of paper, but okay, fine. Uh, this should become the propagator of the standard model times one minus one over M gamma and delta gamma over gamma, something like that. I'm not sure if I got the numerical factors right. Yes. Plus, okay, if you want, there will be the term in the mass, but we're not gonna talk about the term in the mass, yeah. So in, the, in kind of in the narrow width approximation limit, this is what your propagator correction becomes. And this minus delta gamma over gamma is exactly the minus delta gamma total over total. So this is, I think, um, the poster case for when these propagators are relevant. Okay, so they're relevant, no matter what, they're relevant only when you are on shell. If you are off shell, propagator corrections are completely negligible, but when they are on shell, they are important and you can see it because this is the piece that you would naively have to include. Um, now, when you put a generic propagator correction, so you're really doing the integral over Q squared, so typically you're not, you're not using an error with approximation. So if you're putting a propagator correction, it means that you're really drawing the whole diagram and using here that expression of the propagator. What happens is that uh, you can get a spectrum of cases, right? So uh, for instance, if you have um, a decay, uh, we might actually even do it in what is left of this hour. So we can consider a particular example that is relevant. So imagine that you have the decay of the Higgs boson to four fermions. Specifically, we're gonna pick them to be in charge current because it's easier. So we can do a W, a neutrino, an electron, and an electron neutrino. So in the standard model, the, your diagram is this. Okay, so this is the Higgs, W plus, this goes to the mu, to the nu. This is the W minus, this goes to the electron. Voila. Okay, so what happens is that because of the values of the masses, uh, so this is 125, right? The W is 80. So when the Higgs decays, one of the two W is on shell, mostly. So it can be on shell, so it will tend to be on shell. The other one, no, because the other one, We'll have to, so if this guy is exactly on shell, the other, the other has to carry an invariant mass that is the difference of the two approximately. So I, you will never have enough to produce uh, both Ws on shell. You need 160 to do that, right? Um, so what happens is that one of the two currents will have uh, relevant propagator corrections. 
while in the others you will get some number. So if you propagate to correction, you will always get a number, but it will be suppressed because this numerical factor there, the kinematic factor there, suppresses it. So you will get a small, um, a small contribution. Okay, so I want to get to the point where I show you some plots, uh, but first I want to wrap this all up and um, show you where we are after all these redefinitions and input schemes and stuff, and maybe try to uh, write down how a calculation should go. We're not gonna do the whole calculation, but I want to give you some pointers about the procedure. Um, so one thing to look at, mm -hmm. no, I don't know what I want. Okay, is here. Uh, one thing that we can get a sense of is what are the Feynman rules? After all the game of redefinitions that we have done, of course, I'm not going to write them all. Uh, but so anything that has photons and then two fermions or something else is going to have a gamma mu. And then here you will have a structure that generically you can write like this. This is a G prime. Okay, where uh, these deltas are whatever comes out of the solution of your input parameter scheme choice. Okay, so if you have alpha scheme, these blocks are gonna conspire to cancel this guy. If you don't have alpha as an input, these will remain as final corrections, for instance, as an example that we did before. Uh, when you have something with the W, for instance, and I don't know, like two quarks, let's say that this is a U and D, uh, you will have the same standard model structure that you usually have with the projector. You might even have a CKM if you want to have the CKM. And this is gonna receive corrections from the inputs that go in the G. And then you have a direct correction from the operator that produces this vertex directly, okay? So this comes out from input shifting the standard model part, and this comes out from opening the directory dimension six. Uh, remember that the C bar means uh, VT squared over lambda squared. Uh, the one of the Z I'm not gonna write down because between left and right-handed chiralities is horrible. The one of the Yukawa coupling is interesting. So for instance, if you have the Yukawa say of the bottom, so H to BB bar coupling, you will remain uh, with the standard model interaction and this is corrected by the delta kappa h and this you should expect because it comes from the two-point function of the Higgs. Then you will have a delta vt correction. Okay, so this comes from the input. Where did you define the web from? So if this is g fermi, it is going to be a delta g fermi. And then you have the direct contribution of the operator that rescales this guy. If you have a flavor symmetry, so this, I'm assuming a flavor symmetry, this is going to be a CDH bar. Uh, you can have, you can have the gauge couplings. These are also interesting sometimes. They just have an empty structure. So I imagine that you are interested, well, first, okay, we can do something more interesting. So for instance, the coupling of the Higgs to, to Ws, uh, this will be again the same as in the standard model. So you can have a VT and then you have a two, you will have an eta mono where mono are the indices of the W and this will get twice the correction from the G, the correction to the V and the delta kappa h. So you see the sound couplings, for instance, this guy does not receive any direct correction. So there is no operator that when you open it gives you that vertex, but it does get shifts imported from changing the standard model interaction. Well, some others have both, so they need to be kept into account. Uh, and you can have uh, more things. So. Okay, if you have, this we said already before, so if you have the coupling of the photon to W plus, W minus, essentially you will get the standard model vertex 
modified again by <laughs> one plus twice the delta E over E that is exactly the same. So if I'm gonna call this guy, all this combination oof, is gonna be a delta E over E, okay? For the charge universality principle that we discussed in the previous lecture, this is also gonna be the same. Uh, without a two actually, it becomes a two if you want to add a second photon because it goes like E squared. Uh, so this remains like that. I'm not gonna write anything down with the Z because the Z has just complicated expressions, but the message roughly is, uh, is the same. Okay, so let's do this process here just as an idea. Yes. Uh, with how many? <laughs> I have to check. <laughs> I'll tell you later. No, I think it should be uh, the one that is up there, but then there are some corrections. Uh, I don't have it right here. So it is this expression there. So there's definitely a delta MH and a CH, but then this is still missing the input contributions. So there is gonna be, uh, I have to check it. But I can, I'll keep it in mind and I can tell you later because this can be found. Uh, so what I do, I erase. Uh, so I just want to give you a sense of how a calculation unfolds. So we already said the most important things yesterday. So when you want to calculate in this math, you're gonna have to construct an amplitude that because we're working at dimension six, is going to contain uh, essentially a piece that is just the standard model amplitude. And then you will have the dimension six amplitude. So this is the usual one, and this contains one operator of dimension six inserted somewhere. The typical thing that happens uh, when you calculate math in math is that you will have some diagrams that are, let's say, standard model-like. Okay, so if you're considering that Higgs decay, the one up there, some diagrams will have the same shape, but then they will bury some EFT operators that enter into vertices that already exist. So in there, because of the rules that we wrote, we will have, for instance, CHL3, and we will have whatever goes into the input definition of delta G over G. Um, you can also have uh, corrections to the other vertex. So you can have the correction to this guy. It is we also uh, wrote down somewhere. Did I forget something? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, I forgot something. So here there is one operator that contributes directly, sorry. Uh, but it does enter with a different, there's a four and there's an I, with a different uh, momentum structure. So this is a momentum dependent operator. Uh, so here you have to cross, so it means that I'm putting the mu here and the nu there. Cross the indices, no. Uh, no, this has to be a minus eta mono and the product of the two, where these moments are incoming for W and the, and the Z. So in this vertex here, you're gonna have, again, the D delta G over G, uh, the, the delta V over V, <laughs> the delta kappa H, and this operator CHW. So what's gonna happen? is that these guys, if you look at how they appear in the expression, uh, they are gonna have uh, the same kinematic structure as the standard model in the sense that uh, if you look at this, you really have the same uh, Lorentz indices, like the same momentum and uh, um, gamma matrix uh, chirality contractions, while uh, the C, HW operator, this guy here, this is a different Lorentz structure because it, it, the Feynman rules depends on the um, on the momentum now. And in fact, sorry, this is not a bar. This is divided by lighter than the square. Um, so this is going to give you some different shapes in the kinematics of the decay. While the other ones more or less are just going to rescale the decay that, that you have. Uh, and the final thing that can happen, I can add it here is that you have oops, new diagrams. Didn't exist before, I don't have the piece of paper anymore, but I can do it. Uh, the new diagram that you can have is something like this, where now you have a vertex uh, where you attach directly the fermion current to the Higgs and the, and the W. So if you remember, this is one of the things that we said first about the Warsaw basis. 
This is, for instance, the CHL3 operator that, that does it. And this coupling is really related uh, by gauge invariance to the first coupling up there. So by gauge invariance, you have something that is producing something proportional to V plus H. So the part with V gives you W fermion fermion. The part with H gives you this interaction point. And you also have it for the other one, right? So you have this, and then you have uh, the other, the current with the other charge, so with the W minus. So we'll have this. Uh, we should not forget, because we just talked about them, that you can also have the propagator corrections. So not in these diagrams, because you already put in something that is mapped. But another class of standard model-like diagrams is where you don't have these, but you put in the propagator correction in the places where this is needed. Okay, so these are all the ingredients that you need to have. Uh, so the number of operators that enter is finite, as you can notice here. And the message is um, because you have different things, they will give you different kinds of effects. There are mainly two kinds of effects. Uh, one is rescalings of the standard model cross sections, and the other one is changes of shape of the spectrum. Now, this is a decay, so kinematically it is limited. There is never more momentum flow than the mass of the Higgs, so it does not have. Uh, flamboyant, <laughs> let's say, uh, momentum enhancements, uh, but you can you can already see some of the changes. So, so that some of, these are some plots that I made really part and level with uh, with MadGraph, and I will tell you about automation tomorrow. Uh, you have to look at the lower panel. This is off. Uh, you have to look at the lower panel. So this is standard model plus mass normalized to standard model. So one is standard model, and anything is deviations around it. And you have, you see, some contributions for some of the operators, for instance, CH box, that is one of those in the delta kappa H uh, that comes through the Higgs vertex that really give you a completely flat correction. So this is a pure rescaling of the standard model decay width. The purple line is also horizontal, uh, no, sorry. The blue line is also horizontal. This is CLL prime. CLL prime goes through uh, the correction of uh, delta V. This is done in MW, uh, MW scheme. So MW, MZ, and G Fermi as inputs. So in that case, the CLL prime only enters here. And this also gives you only a rescaling of that coupling. Um, the solid yellow line is CHW. And I told you this has to give some different shape. And you see that it has some shape. Uh, this is, OK, for instance, the distribution on the invariant mass of a muon and a neutrino, which is something you don't measure. but. Uh, something you can do in a Monte Carlo. So this does have some shape. CHL3 also has some shape, and it's very large. So the largest one is this CHL3, that is the red line. Uh, and it has a shape because of that diagram, because that diagram does not look like the standard model. And it is large because uh, it's chopping out one of the propagators, right? So compared to the standard model one, this has one propagator less. If this is the, the off-shell propagator, not having the propagator is better than having it, right? So off-shell propagator is a suppression, and that guy does not have a suppression. If both of these had been on-shell propagators, then that one would have been smaller <laughs> compared to the standard model, OK? So it, it depends on the kinematics that you can have. Because one of them can always be off-shell, uh, basically, not having one of the propagators is always an enhancement. You put on shell one guy, and you don't pay the suppression for the other in that diagram, essentially. Uh, and then the dashed lines are the pieces that come from the propagator corrections. Uh, and you see that they are basically zero here, zero there, and then they have some bumps. So it is visible here, and it is visible in the bulk. So it is visible basically in this peak and in the lower part. So this peak is where uh, the W boson that produces the muon and the neutrino is on shell. Okay, so this is where the propagator thing uh, fires up. And you see that it has um, CHQ3 and CHL3. Okay, I didn't have time to explain today, but in the decay width of the W, they enter exactly identical with the same coefficient but opposite signs. So the purple and the red dashed are really mirroring each other. And then it fires up here. Uh, so here, the, the W that produces the muon is off shell, but the other one that is producing the electron is on shell. So what you're seeing here is the propagator turning on on the other one that you're not plotting. Uh, and when none of them is on shell, this vanishes, completely dies off. 
So this is all linear terms. Yesterday we talked also about uh, some quadratic terms. Let me think for a second what this is. Ah, sorry, this is another, okay, this is another distribution, this is invariant mass of the two leptons, but okay, it's again the same method. So in this plot, you don't really see where the propagator is resonant and whatnot. It's more kind of uh, smeared out, but okay, it's the same thing. Uh, what is maintained is that what had to be constant, so the constant rescalings are confirmed as constant rescalings, whatever variable you plot them in. And things that modify the kinematics still modify the kinematics, and you can still see them here. Uh, this is the plot with some quadratics. So here, I think that all the dashed lines are uh, mixed quadratics. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit messy. And the solid ones are exact quadratics. What, what I mean is that you have terms where you have ci squared and terms where you have ci cj with i different from j. Okay, so these are dashed and these are solid. And you should notice, going from here to here, that this scale changes. So this was 10%, 20%, now this is 2%. So the quadratic here is small, it's tiny. And it's tiny because it's a decay. It's kinematically limited. Um, and so most of the corrections really go like v squared over lambda squared. It's a pole observable. And, and so v squared over lambda squared is already 6%. If you square it, it becomes 6%. So times 6%, uh, so two others are much smaller. Um, you, still, you see the sum of them have some energy enhancement. So like this guy here that has the propagator or the, the yellow line, they still have some momentum dependence. So they would be enhanced at high uh, momentum exchange, but then you cannot exchange more than 125. So this thing dies off and doesn't really explode uh, kinematically. And yeah, you can have some that are negative between, so the, uh, I don't know what happened to the CHW, okay, fine. So these guys can, can, be, can be negative when they're mixed and they pick up some shapes and so on and so forth. But okay, so I think I, I gave you all the messages that I needed to give. Um, so maybe, okay, maybe I can give you one last, uh, which is, so that one was a decay. This is a plot from a different process. This is the boson production. So this is PP that goes to two Ws. So instead of having the Higgs that decays to two Ws, now they are produced at the LHC, so they have momentum. Okay, they're not uh, kinematically limited. Uh, and these are some plots that we made, well, actually, uh, Giacomo Baldrini made uh, for a paper uh, a couple of years ago. And these are two kinematic distributions. That doesn't really matter. What matters is that on the left, he's plotting against CLL prime. And CLL prime, uh, this is a different process, but the vertices are more or less the same. It's always something that comes from the inputs. The stuff that comes from the inputs, by definition, always rescales the standard model interaction. So CLL prime is always something that uh, gives a normalization effect most of the time. And you see here that, uh, so this is a flat, so the ratio to standard model is completely flat, normalization. And the other feature that comes with this typically, even when you go at high, higher momenta and you're not kinematically limited, is that uh, whenever this guy is flat, then the quadratic correction, which is the green that dashed here, dash dot, uh, and uh, is smaller than the linear piece. So the interference piece is the dotted purple, and the quadratic is roughly an order of magnitude smaller, this is in log scale. So whenever you have something that goes with the inputs, goes with the V squared over lambda squared, does not have momentum dependence, gives you something flat, and it also gives you that the, the linear is always larger than the quadratic, because V squared over lambda squared is always smaller than one. When you go to different classes of operators, this is CHQ1, uh, so it's the equivalent of this guy, but with quarks. So what is this doing is that uh, it is essentially producing one of the Ws. Uh, how is this? Oof, now I don't remember anymore. No, okay, sorry. It is, it's just changing the kinematic. I'm not going to write diagrams because there's a couple of them. There. It's actually not a contact term, uh, but it is modifying the... Um, uh, the quark coupling at the beginning. So this is actually giving the Z, the Z to WW. Okay, fine. So you have quarks here, and CQ1 enters here. It is a rescaling of the standard model, but for the Z, things are tricky because you have the left and the right-handed part. This is only changing the left, it's not touching the right. So it is changing the kinematics anyways. Uh, and it does bear some momentum dependence, okay? because of this, because some cancellations are different than in the standard model. Then this is momentum enhanced. So if you look at what happens when you put it in, uh, now this goes even off scale, but so it grows the correction 
relative to standard model as you go to larger momenta. And the feature that comes with it is that now the quadratic is larger than the linear contribution. Because uh, when you have a momentum and end structure, your suppression factor is not v squared over lambda squared anymore, is momentum squared over lambda squared. And the momentum is not a fixed number, it's not 245, it's something that grows, okay, it's not really, so this is the met, so it's not really the number that appears here, it's the momentum exchange in the vertex. So this factor can become larger than one if you go to two high energies. Um, and empirically, you observe this sort, of, uh, this sort of phenomena. So this is kind of the generic phenomenology that you always have when you do, when you do SMEFT. In a way, the days are safer because being kinematically limited, you're always sure that the linear term dominates and that everything is well behaved. The drawback is that um, the effects that we saw here are of 10, 20% at most. Uh, the advantage of going to higher momenta is that you see this goes beyond 50% at some point, it's just skyrockets. Um, so you have larger effects, but also it's harder to tell uh, when the FT is making sense because this feature typically comes with the quadratic being larger than the linear term. You don't, you, you don't always know if this is safe or, uh, or not. Okay, and with this, we're late, so I'm going to wrap it up. And tomorrow we talk a bit about the automation, if I have time, about what happens to go to higher orders compared to what we have done so far. <laughs>